Well, hello everybody. Welcome to another live stream of History by Podcast. Today I'm joined by Zara K. And Zara is an ex-Muslim. She left Islam when she was 24 years old. And by 2018, she founded the Faithless Hijabi, which helps other people tell their stories about leaving Islam. And it also helps other people that are questioning Islam. And, and they can go to the website and look at the website to find assistance in their journey and leaving the religion and to hear other people's stories about leaving Islam. And with that being said, welcome to History by Podcast, Sarah. I can't, I can't hear you. You're muted. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I forgot to unmute. But thank you so much for having me. Um, of course. Maybe I could add a little more on what we do at Faithless Ajabi, just to sure. add on to what you said. Um, our main program at the moment is providing mental health support. Mm -hmm. So one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions to ex-Muslims. Um, mm -hmm. And we do that online globally, especially in countries where people can't get support with their anxiety or a lot of mental health issues that comes with feeling isolated when you leave the faith. Mm. And I'll be leaving links uh, uh, to the, the website in the description below. And that being said, um, I'd like to start us off with this question. What? So can you tell us a story of uh, what caused you to leave Islam? What, what, what started you on that journey? I think mm. for most of us who've left the faith, it's always never like a one answer of like when that happened, but... A lot of it has to do with those questions that come up when you're very young that are unanswered for the longest times. And for me, it was the same. I mean, I was 24 when I did renounce it publicly, but it took years for me to get there. And I think for the longest time, you know, I always pushed away the questions that were contradicting um, my beliefs as well. Um, and a lot of that had to do with women's rights, but also um, homophobia, Islamic homophobia as well. But I think even just the question of why can't I see God when I was a child? Or why am I meant to love God more than my family? And there were these innocent questions that I think at some point built up to a lot more that was really hard to ignore. And primarily when I did support my, when I did um, voice my support for uh, gay marriage or against homophobia, I got a lot of backlash from my community in Tanzania. And I think to me, I always thought that I was raised in a progressive community or we weren't as radical and we were a bit more, I guess, I guess not as conservative as um, a lot of different cultures could be, but I think it was until up until that point or when and after I left as well that I actually kind of, you know, was challenged in my view of was I not really, was I really raised progressive? Um, just seeing a lot of the death threats come my way, you know, for being supportive of gay marriage or against homophobia or like the basic of stop what stop sending people death threats resulted in me being alienated and receiving death threats as well and i think that's the point when i was like where's the verse in the quran that talks about you know two muslims disagreeing in their faith and they can still be you know friends you know you can have different ideas about what islam could be but you could still find common ground and I was surprised that there was none. And the verses that I did find that were close to that were followed by, but if they disagree with you in faith, you should kill them. And that was probably the most shocking thing for me. Um, and then I think after that, I think after that specific time, I or that specific incident, I don't think I could actually move forward with um, still believing but that was kind of like in a nutshell what actually happened and I think where it started to kind of break down for me. So basically what you're saying is when, when you look at the Quran, 
we found it disturbing what it was saying about what to do to non-believers and what and what to do to people that left the faith as well that there was no room for compromise it's just pure violent yeah i mean yes like by its scripture i felt like it was there i guess there were interpretations that were quite violent and in practice in a lot of the a lot of different parts of the world even though my family never practiced it it was i still had to break down to well there are other people who go through this there are other journalists in bangladesh that were killed because they wrote about atheism or disbelief or even challenged religious um theocracy or actually radicalism as well and for me that was really hard to then go like but my version of islam is different and because I had left home when I was 16, I'd, I was studying abroad, I had built up this rainbow kind of like fluffy view of Islam, which I was like, you know, which in my head was like, it's my relationship with God and how I can still view and love people. And I'm not a sinner if I do X, Y, Z, because I'm still inherently a good person. And I believe that for so long until, you know, when I was 23, 24. And I think it was up until that point when I saw people that I grew up with, people that I thought would share the similar views or would actually agree with me on not being hateful towards other people when they kind of wrote really horrible stuff on a Facebook post. I was surprised. These were people whose houses I had been in who, who had come to, you know, who, whose families I knew. And, you know, in my head, I was like, oh my God, these people are just wrong. So I'm going to prove them wrong by actually going in the Quran and looking up all of this. And I was actually, I think reading the Quran is actually what brought me at crossroads with my faith and my values. Does Islam have different denominations with vastly different interpretations of the Quran, like, say, Christianity has lots of denominations with very different views on the Bible? Or are there views not so, not as different compared to Christianity, Christianity that has different, uh, vastly different views of the Bible? I think it depends on what kind of view. So the major denominations are the Shias and the Sunnis. And they have a lot in common, and then they have some facts or some their own historical interpretations of things. And then even within those major groups, there are people who also, they're, they're subsects as well, so different school of thoughts as well. And, you know, an issue like FGM in one school of thought will be, it's good to have done, like female genital mutilation, it's good to have done on women, and some sects will actually have it as it is compulsory for women um and i think it all comes down to not just the interpretation of the quran but also the interpretation or the stories of muhammad and who it was written by because that's when the sects start to break down which is mostly when muhammad died and you know the shias and the sunnis emerged and they had different scholars under each and a lot of it was quite, in many ways, quite segregated. And I would say many groups in some countries don't even get along, like in Iran, for instance, and Saudi Arabia, the majority being quite separate. Um, but within Iran as well, yes, there are Shia is the majority, but Sunnis are a minority and they're not as respected. And same thing in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I thought, as when I was young, I always thought that, oh, you know, we're all one anyway. And I remember when I was like 19, 20, and I was like, I'm not a Shia, I'm not a Sunni, I'm just a Muslim. Like, I don't believe in this segregation, but the reality was quite far away, far from what I wanted it to be. So there, there were still a lot of differences between the two that, you know, when I meet, when I met people from different groups as well, depending if they were young, they were more open about the being united. But if they were older generations, it was a bit hard. But I was also raised as a Shia, which 
you know, in in Tanzania, I kept thinking or I was told that, you know, we are the right sect and we're so lucky to be part of this religion, but not only also being part of this sect as well. And you grow up like that and you don't realize that it subconsciously kind of gives you the superiority amongst other people. And when I'd left home at 16, you know, being in a country that exposed to exposed me to multiple different people, different religions, different ethnicities and nationalities, it was really hard to kind of have that mindset and still think, oh, but like, I'm going to heaven and all of these others are not. So that's how I'd created my own version of it because I couldn't be okay with the ver with like my friends and you know people who were gay or who were also my friends, but you know different people who didn't believe in what I did were going to hell. And that way, I was quite a bit oblivious to the differences that existed. Um, and that's why I think it took me longer to leave Islam because while I was not at home, it was easier for me to practice or just think that, you know, my version of Islam is fine. It's good. Like, you know, I get the rights I do. I, you know, the people, the women who don't get the rights they do, it ha it's their families or it's their cultures and it's not Islam. And I was an Islamic apologist, but maybe not as loudly as um, what we find online right now. So you stopped wearing the hijab several years before you um, actually deconverted from the faith. So can you tell us about what what caused you to stop wearing that and what what was it like? Um, what did you have to deal with uh, when you made the decision not to wear that anymore? Yeah, I mean, I think for me personally, it took me years to just, you know, even after I'd removed the hijab to be comfortable in my own body and my own skin. Um, but my decision that led up to me removing it had a lot to do with what other people thought of me um, as compared to what God would have thought of me at the time. And it was very much for me, the decision to what took so long was also holding on to that fear that, you know, I will be name called, I will be slut shamed and, you know, I am not... I don't feel connected to the religion um, or I, I thought that maybe it's because I don't feel connected to the religion and I should be and I should continue wearing it. So it was a lot of back and forth until I actually made the decision. But I think for me, when I was 16 and I emphasize on that age is because it opened up a lot of my worldviews, including before I left home, I didn't know you could be a Muslim woman and not wear a hijab I think the thought just never crossed my mind and I knew that there were people that I'd seen in movies or people that I saw did not wear hijab but you know still had Muslim names but in my head there were just bad Muslim women so I didn't know that you could not wear a hijab and still be a good Muslim as well so when I left to Malaysia and I was in a prayer room um, in a shopping mall and I saw somebody who wasn't wearing a hijab come in and you know she th they were they were clothes for women there where you know you can cover up while you're praying she put that on prayed you know finished took it off left and i think that was a very innocent you know light bulb moment for me and i was like oh my god i i didn't think about this like this woman is here and she's clearly praying so that means she's good and she's not wearing a hijab and maybe I was being a bit stupid about it, but because every woman in my family had worn a hijab, people were as close to it. It was never a question of not wearing a hijab. The question was, when will you wear it? And usually girls would wear it from the ages of eight to 12, um, most likely when they were younger. And that's when you know I wore it as well, when I was eight. And when that happened, that it, you know, that moment happened where this girl had come in and, you know, left, I was like, oh my God, I can not wear a hijab um, and still be a good Muslim woman. 
And I think ever since then, it was, you know, slowly trying to loosen it up or trying to different styles because I felt so restricted wearing it all black. And also I used to wear an abaya as well, which is like the black cloth, not the complete like face covering, but you cover your body as well. And you wear a headscarf. And I started styling it a bit more, but I think my initiative to style it was kind of to still feel beautiful, but also modest as well. And it was slowly when I was like, okay, maybe I want to loosen it and try moving it. And when I actually did, I was still around people who knew that I, I was wearing a hijab. So it was harder at the time, but what made it easier is when I moved to Australia after I had lived in Malaysia for a couple couple of years, um, and then it was like starting over. So I just never wore the hijab when I was in Australia, and I told my parents or my mom that I wasn't going to wear it. And the way they rationalized it, my the way my family rationalized it was, oh well, you know, Australians have a lot of white people and Westerners. She might be racially abused, so she's being safe. But in my head, it was something completely different, which was my own agency to be able to not wear. And even after I removed the hijab, I always wore long sleeves. I was like, you know, nothing that would show more skin than it needs to be, loose clothing. Um, I was just not comfortable because leaving the hijab at the time felt to me like something was taken from me, but I had made that decision. And it was really hard. It was it was a massive step to do that, let alone then be comfortable going out and not isolating yourself. Um, and, you know, when I posted pictures or I had my profile picture on, I don't know if we had WhatsApp at the time, probably not, but like if I had it online on Facebook at the time, and all my friends from Tanzania or even from Malaysia were like, oh, you're not wearing a hijab anymore. I was slut shamed and I was told I was trying to be like white people. And, you know, some people that found me online, I didn't know them, even started sending me death threats over it or calling me a slut or, you know, sending rape threats as well. Um, and it kind of silenced me for the longest time, this was pre me being, being an activist or anything, but it silenced me quite a bit because then I just felt like, oh, I should not post any photos online. I should pretend like I'm still wearing the hijab. So even when I went to Tanzania, after I'd removed the hijab, when I went there for holiday, I'd still wear a hijab up until 2015. Um, and that was about three, four years after I'd removed it. And I think in my in my head, it was all about protecting myself or my family's reputation because it was very tied to what I do and the shame and guilt I bring to the family as a woman. Yeah, that's terrible that you receive um, these horrific frets. And did, 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 did these frets increase when you actually left the faith? publicly yeah i mean i can't i think when i left the faith i didn't even remember what i'd received when i removed the hijab or how i was shamed by my own friends that i grew up with and that was probably really hard for me to just accept as well like you know i've not changed you know i've just removed the hijab in the same way i was like i've not changed i've just decided that this faith is no longer something I believe in or heck even value. And it was, I wasn't even being, I'd not even talked about anything blasphemous about or anything about um, why I didn't agree with Islam. It was simply at the start, it was simply because I'm like, oh, I've left because, you know, this doesn't align with my values. And just that first podcast of mine, received a lot of attention from my community because I was the first one doing it. And we're a pretty big community in Tanzania. Um, anybody who's been to like East Africa or even parts of Canada, UK and the US, the community extends. So we have like our own, it's like Jehovah's Witnesses. 
kind of a bit different but the community extends to all those places like they're all networked by their own leaders in the mosques or by constitution and you know when i'd left islam people that i'd never met in a different continent that i'd <laughs> never known existed knew about me and they were suddenly like I got some messages of, you know, love and support and people saying, you know, you should do what you feel like. But a lot of, but those were really small as compared to the amount of hate I received or the amount of um, sexual violence, verbal sexual violence that I received because I was a woman. So not only was now I an ex-Muslim or an apostate of Islam, I was also a woman who was, who I think in their minds when they were sending me the threats was also free to be taken or, you know, free to be exploited. So as compared to my male colleagues who are also ex-Muslims, us women, when we left, there were a lot of like rape threats that were coming our way. Or for the men who did leave, their mothers or their sisters would get threats because of them. And I think... It's a lot better now, but at the time, because it was still new and there were a lot of ex-Muslims coming up and talking about it, um, I think it was a bit more harsher then than it is now. Um, or maybe I haven't been very active right now, so perhaps that's the reason. But I think at the time it was quite harsh and it was nothing as compared to when I'd actually removed the hijab. I think the only thing that kept me safe was that I was in Australia and that I wasn't in Tanzania or in a Muslim majority country or, you know, even around a community that was religious as well. So we have a super chat question. I'm going to pull it up in just a second. Um, Nasser Karos, thank you for your super chat. He says, what are your thoughts on patience? Sabr, patience? Um, I, I would like a bit more clarity on that question. Um, yeah. But I mean, I guess maybe I'm missing some chats before I, I wasn't looking at the chats. No, uh, this, uh, there, this Nasser didn't provide any context to the question, so I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure what I would be patient about, mm -hmm. um, but unless that was a typo. Um, I, I don't really have any thoughts. So if there's more clarity, I would really like that, or if there's more context on it. Um, but yeah. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about the case of Rahaf Muhammad? Uh, I know that the, the faithless hijab helped Rahaf um, in Rahaf's uh, situation. Yeah, um, I had known of Rahaf when I was actually on the airplane Wi-Fi, which, is, which wasn't great. So I'd just seen tweets come up. And while the charity at the time was all about sharing stories and there were a lot of women that wanted to talk about what they had been through, Rahaf kind of fell between that. And while she was in Thailand at the time, and that's when I was alerted about her, I spoke to a couple of journalists who were in Australia trying to help her. And my role was quite small at the time. There were a lot of people trying to help her. It was quite new for a lot of the Western world as well. But especially because she was planning on coming to Australia that alerted other organizations that were, I guess, ex-Muslim related, but also Muslim women related. And that's where I kind of came in. And I'm like, what can I do? Or where can I provide support? But for Rahaf, I think it was quite brave of her to do what she did. And, you know, Rahaf was, I think, 18 at the time. She had just turned 18, maybe, at the time when she left Saudi Arabia. Um, when she when she left Saudi Arabia and, you know, she was in Thailand en route to Australia, but then they stopped her because 
apparently, maybe not her, but apparently other Saudi girls have been asked whether they're traveling with a male guard, guardian or they have approval. But I think in her case, it might be related, but I think her family reported her missing or the, you know, the Thai authorities were like, okay, something is odd here. How, how can a Saudi woman alone travel? And I think they were also perpetrating Saudi Arabia's misogynistic laws as well. Um, and that was quite hard for Rahab because she's in a country, she doesn't speak the language, she's locked herself inside the room. And one of the journalists from Australia flew to uh, Thailand to be with her. And I think her strength there has been being online and being online when she was at the airport and recording everything and showing the world. And I know since then, a lot of women have tried. Some of them have failed, a lot of people. And it's really sad because there are a lot more people who wouldn't dare to try as well, but are in situations that are quite cruel to them, not just in Saudi. Sometimes it's in the West as well, where social services or you know support systems are not available or don't quite understand the how faith, culture and families intersect and how that can be quite traumatizing for somebody who is then neglected by the services that are meant to keep them safe. Um, but Rahaf couldn't, in the end, come to Australia because her asylum wasn't, or her re asylum status wasn't approved for her to come. She was going to come on a tourist visa. Uh, and Canada jumped in, and it made sense for her to go to Canada instead. So my role in Rahaf was quite small, where we were trying to arrange a safe house, and we'd rented a safe house, and we were hoping that the Australian authorities would then provide her a visa to come to Australia, but they didn't. And, you know, she ultimately went to Canada. But very similarly, I think it was 2022, where two Saudi sisters were in Australia and they were murdered and nobody knows why they were murdered in, in Australia. Um, nobody had known why, what happened. And it kind of tells me that there could have been a link that, you know, her family, the, the Saudi girls' his family had come to Australia to hurt them. And there were no clues about what happened. And, you know, while they were already in a safe place, they were also, you know, they also faced a repercussion that many women would have faced if they were caught in the middle or if they never left home or that they were caught trying to leave home as well. So Nasser super chatted uh, again, providing context. Master thank you for your super chat. Political quietism in Islam, sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> Nasser, if you can write a bit more, I, I don't understand what that means. But if you're talking about why a lot of people are quiet about Islam in politics or why a lot of religious people are talking, are not talking about Islam and kind of shielding it, then I think a lot has to do with people in my opinion, a lot has to do with people claiming the word Islamophobia. Um, it's, I think it's a word that is, uh, in my opinion, made up. And it's now, it should have been used to protect Muslims from discrimination and bigotry, but has now been used for any discrimination, not discriminate, any criticism that Islam rece receives because of that, or anything that people talk about that could be remotely asserted that it is in opposition to Muslims versus an idea and that way giving Islam a protection against any criticism um, which is really which is really stupid because we don't hold the same standards to Christianity and I think we're in a climate where Islam has you know evidently in a lot of parts you know, We've, we've, we've seen a lot of criticism rise because it's affected many lives as well. Stories like Rahaf were only one, but that we saw a lot of honor killings happening because women did not wear the hijab in Italy or when women had relationships outside of marriage and there were honor killings because of that or any reason one of them could be somebody was on TikTok and getting beaten up. 
And, you know, the reason was because they weren't modest, because they weren't following Islam or because they weren't following, following Islam the way it should be, or because they were just, you know, kind of put down to be ob objectified as well. And I think that's possibly because, you know, the word is possibly existing because a lot of the left has validated it as well in the, I guess, sometimes in good spirits to make sure that it's not criticism of people or not criticism, but bigotry of people. But I think that's when people confuse it and then even continuously try to protect Islam from being scrutinized, a lot of us who do talk about valid, um, you know, valid criticisms of the faith are then silenced as well. And it just becomes this mountain of you know, people continuing to silence others, including even Muslims as well, who are progressive. And, you know, they're also silenced into submission. And I think that word just helps a lot of radical movements more than it helps, you know, bring about more harmony between different people. Can you tell us about what happened at Dar es Salaam, when you were held there for 42 hours, why did that happen? Um, I was in Tanzania for a holiday. Well, it was during COVID and I could work from home and my family was going through a difficult time. So I flew to Tanzania. I was only meant to be there for three weeks, but I decided to extend my trip. I got permission from work to stay there longer and it was all working fine. So I was fine for the first three months. And then I I didn't realize it then, but my brother was um, called in by the police station during Christmas so on the 25th when there are no real polices working except for the ones on the ground. Um, when I say on the ground, I, actually, I, I mean, detectives don't work or like the police officers don't work, but the police work. So he was called on the 25th and we're like, why are we called on Christmas? And, you know, he had he wasn't told why he was being called in. And when he when you know, when he went to the police station on three days later, um, they basically took his phones, show open Facebook, showed them my profile profile. And they're like, we want her but they didn't know how to reach me. Um, so they tried getting my brother first. And um, when, you know, and then he calls me and he talks to me in English and we don't talk to each other in English. Uh, I'm, I'm not in the same way anyway. Um, and he talks to me in English and I'm like, well, something is going wrong and why do they want me? And I'm like, well, he, you know, he hung up. He only had a 20 second call with me. And, you know, I go in, but before I go in, I post up a tweet because I was getting a lot of threats about a photo I posted that was blasphemous. So I post up a th tweet saying, no, I've been called to the police station. It's probably something blasphemous. Um, and that's what I thought at the time. And it was ultimately true, but there were no real charges. So I get called into the police station and I go in, they take my devices and they're like, we want your Tanzanian ID. And I'm not Tanzanian. I was I, I was an Australian citizen at the time, still am. Um, and I'm like, well, I'm not Tanzanian. I have my Australian passport. I haven't used my Tanzanian passport ever since I got my Australian passport. And now they're worried because you know they're there and you know they're trying to arrest me, but they have no real charges. And they tried bringing up bogus claims, like me writing something about COVID and the president in Tanzania. And I was like, well, I wrote that, you know, the Tanzania, the how Tanzanian government is handling, handling COVID is quite sad to see what's happening to the number of people that are dying. And I wasn't in Tanzania when I wrote it. That charge did not stick. They tried putting different charges about my citizenships. None of them stuck. But I think I was arrested. Well, I know I was arrested to be intimidated. And while I was kept in prison for 32 hours. They didn't have anything to charge me on, but they stole my Australian passport and never returned it actually. So I couldn't leave the country. I had no formal charge sheet. I didn't never went to court. They was there was it was like I was never arrested. Like on paper, there was no paper trail. Um, the Australian embassy were a bit useless. Um, 
they they insisted that I shouldn't go through the Minister of Foreign Affairs and make it like a, you know, make it like a big deal. And I should try to finish the situation just in Tanzania if I need to bribe. They didn't say that, but they're like, just finish it, like just end it there as as much as you can. Um, so, you know, they were, they're very persistent and I'm like, look, this is not working. Like I can't do anything. I've not been given a charge. They've just taken my passport. Nobody is really letting me go and they're not telling me why I'm here. And, you know, I had lawyer, I had a lawyer in Tanzania who I feel like did not do his job because he never even communicated with the embassy, um, at all. Like completely, he never had it, you know, for three months, he'd never communicated with them, which is a bit odd to me. And it was until I reached out to somebody on Twitter who was a lawyer and, you know, they were a good, I guess they were a big um, legal firm that had worked on a lot of UN arbitrary arrests as well. And thankfully they had an office in Australia where their lawyers went and met. And this is like three days after working with me they went and met with the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Australia, gave me a passport, and that's how I actually got a passport. But the Australian government did, want, did not want to give me a passport because they weren't sure whether my charges were dropped. However, nobody had communicated to them that you know the charges were filed in the first place because there was no paper trail. So it was a catch-22 where I couldn't get out of any of it. Um, but in custody, I was asked questions about what I was doing in Tanzania and, you know, why would I change my citizenship or why would I leave Islam and what my charity does and why have I come to Tanzania, like, insistently because I'd left Islam. Um, and they never let me write my statement down on paper. They made me change it multiple times. And when I said, no, I wouldn't change it, they threatened to arrest my entire family. And they can do that. They can do that. So it was it was a scary place and it was hard because I've grown up in Tanzania and I know that regardless of what the constitution says, if people don't like you there, they can get you arrested. And at the time I was arrested, there were a lot of activists who are Tanzanians getting arrested. But because I was international, it was really hard for them to continue to um, keep the... I guess, continue to keep um, holding me for that long. Um, usually, if they have no charge, they usually have to let you go in like 48 hours or something. And that's that's what happened. But because I had no passport, I couldn't leave. And they never admitted to take my passport, even though they then gave me a lost report. So the news was also very... The news coming from Tanzania was also very confusing because they kept lying about things because they can't really say that, oh, we arrested somebody between Christmas and New Year's when the when none of the senior detectives are there or anything or senior police officers and we have no charges. But because I'd filed an initial tweet before I went to the police station, it became a lot bigger and then they had to respond with something. So they had to cover their backs as well. But it was, um, yeah, it was, it was quite, I mean, it was quite sad that people have to go through that because they protest, uh, no, because they don't agree with the government. But in my case, I couldn't, they didn't have a charge. They couldn't arrest me for writing that I didn't agree with the Tanzanian government because I'm a foreigner and I have my rights to free speech and I wasn't in the country when I wrote it. But I think ultimately when, you know, the police got into trouble for arresting me after I had left, like after the 32 hours and when people had come back from New Year's, the police who interrogated me and arrested me actually got in trouble and they were reassigned. They weren't in that police station, but they were reassigned after. And I only found out about it, you know, a month or so later. Um, it was kind of obvious that my community had sent me threats before when I was in Tanzania um, and I went to pick up my niece from school, my brother got a call saying that she cannot be on school grounds because she's not a Muslim. And while that's, and while the school is an Islamic school, it is still, 
it still has people who are not Muslims who still go to that school. So my brother immediately knew that that was bullshit. And if he wanted me outside the school grounds, um, he needs to write a letter. He needs to like give me like a formal warning. And because I did not listen, which is I was still picking my niece up from school because I had to, my brother was busy. Um, it just felt like this was their way to punish me. And what made it worse was that, you know, when I did say that I think this charge is motivated by my community, the journalists interviewed one of the leaders of the community and they lied. And they lied. They're like, no, we have no issues with her. And, you know, we're good friends with her dad. We just saw him yesterday. And my dad was bedridden for three weeks because he was sick. So there were the small details that they kept lying about it. And it was so obvious that when I left Tanzania and the government could not publicly say anything about the charges, they just said, oh, we let her go. We never took her passport. And I'm like, oh, why do I have an emergency passport? It was like a battle of they said and I said that it was obvious to a lot of people after I left that I was that I was telling the truth about my community motivating these charges or the arrest. And a lot of it has to do with like me being an ex-Muslim. That was also the first time I went back home. And Tanzania is a secular country, but being an African country that is in the hands of a corrupt government or could have corrupt gov authorities, they are susceptible to bribery as well. And that's kind of the reason why, you know, a lot of the facts did not make sense when I was there and I'm, I'm trying to piece things together. The charges they told me do not make sense. They kept lying about different things. And I was like, okay, well, you kind of have to give me a charge sheet. You have to tell me what's happening so I can go to court. But none of that due procedure happened. And then in the end, they just pretended like, oh, we had nothing on her. So we had to let her go. But, you know, yes, that's true. But at the same time, they couldn't just admit the, that they were motivated charges or like they were politically motivated charges. So why do you think they never gave you your passport back? I have no idea. I'm still trying to answer it because essentially the passport, like your passport does not belong to you. It belongs to the government you're from. So them, ha them getting my passport had a lot to do with not letting me leave. Um, and I have no idea why I never got it. And it was a bit stupid of the Australian government to not give it to me as well so it was until i had these lawyers who could see through because i've been through so many arbitrary arrests they're like this is stupid like we're gonna get in and like you know three four days of me working with them after three months of nothing happening i got my passport which was like oh i just needed a lawyer who would vouch for me and you know my first lawyer never did that yeah, that is very strange um take this next super chat Eunice and Cleon thank you for your super chat you are so brave I admire you well thank you and I agree yeah sorry That's I haven't cool. done a podcast in so long I've, um, I've been really busy like after the arrest rebuilding everything like I lost my job because a lot of Muslims emailed my employers um, about wow. the arrest and you know, it was really like I lost my job, not because I think it was motivated by people emailing. But then I was also out of the country and they're like, oh, you have to come back in two weeks. And I'm like, I don't have my passport. I can't come back. And they're like, OK, well, we have to end your contract. And I'm like, OK. Well, so it took, so it's been a while of me being quiet because I've been trying to rebuild a lot of my life. But also um, I'm really excited to kind of work in the background and growing the charity as well. So I remember literally the day I was getting arrested, I was working on, emer on an emergency case, you know, on my phone with a colleague of somebody stuck in, I think, Lebanon. And I was like, oh, be right back. I'm just talking, to, like, I was talking my, telling my colleague, I was like, oh, be right back. Um, I'm just going to go to prison or like, I'm just going to go to jail. The police need me. And she was like, what? <laughs> and, um, oh, sorry, I should clarify. I have two jobs. I have like my day job and then I have my charity, which is... Um, basically um, supporting ex-Muslims, but, you know, even consulting on emergency cases, you know, in case, you know, any of the previous cases I've worked with can provide any background to current cases I work with.
Bassem Kabesh, thank you for your question. Do you think the issue of leaving Islam is the religion itself or the pastoral institution that made it look like a cult? Um, I think so, yes. I mean, there are, there, are, there are a lot of overlaps with Islam as a religion in practice in communities as well or by constitution that overlap with what cults do and one of them is like you know somebody being on power and then somebody you know somebody being on power and you have to follow them so you know coming from a shia sect it was all about the ayatollahs in iran or iraq um, but also then community leaders who could enforce the constitution which is very clearly discriminatory against women where women cannot be members only men can be members and women are, you know, are either mothers, sisters, wives, or daughters of the person who is a member. So by extension them, um, but also just seeing how people who dissent, so not just leave Islam, but it would be people who remove the hijab and a lot of women have are treated by the community leaders, but also, you know, things like, you know, my experience, if you were here early on, I said, like, you know, I had a post that was, um, oh, thank you, Eunice, uh, the LGBT civil, uh, civil rights, sorry. Um, you know, my post about the homophobia in Islam, um, just seeing how people from my community and otherwise, like friends of mine from Malaysia, reacted to, like, I was a Muslim back then fighting for LGBT rights. And I was like, you know, as Muslims, we should be loving, we shouldn't be judging people, etc. I received so much hate for being a Muslim and supporting LGBT rights. And, you know, those are acts of dissent that the community as a whole tends to isolate. And it wasn't just me that faced the repercussions, it was my entire family that faced my re the repercussions, and they're still Muslims. But because they talked to me, they faced a lot of hate, they faced isolation, but you know, they had each other, so they made things work. And I realized that when I'd left Islam, and you know, regardless of what I, you know, my activism or like, you know, just living my life, I was very short sighted about how that would affect my family. I didn't think about it because I'm like, okay, but you guys are Muslims, so you know, you should be fine. And you know, we're still family, like, you know, we made it work. And it was, it was hard at first, you know, being very difference in our values and especially when you leave the faith it can be one of the most important things for you for the first year because you're still navigating so much of yourself there's there's anger there is um isolation there is you know loss of identity and you know this is why the you know just adding in the faithless hijabi mental health program really helps people with like navigate a lot of these with a therapist but when you're alone, having to deal with all of that and still being around Muslims can be really hard. It's very challenging as well. Um, so when I had left Islam, like, you know, while me and my family made it work and we were really trying to be cordial and, you know, we now have a very good relationship now. They faced a lot of repercussions because I had made the decision to leave because I had... Um, because I had removed the hijab, you know, my sisters were like, this was even before me leaving Islam, my sisters being, were being told off that, oh, nobody's going to marry the women in your family because your sister doesn't wear a hijab. And it was crazy. Like this, this isn't like one person doing it. This is like a lot of people. There were a lot of people who were bullying my family, but also my arrest and seeing how I was treated. Um, and just seeing that, the support or even the anger people had for me while I was in a situation that was compromising my safety was it, it, it does seem like a cult, like how they treat you and how they continue to put you down and they isolate you from family and friends or they have the superiority where we are the right ones and everybody else is wrong. Uh, but maybe I can talk about the LGBT civil rights and, and Islam because I'm very passionate about this, sure. mostly because... I had, I guess I had never, so, you know, leaving home was my, really opened up the way I viewed things and what I had known. So I didn't know what homosexuality was at all. It's just something I was never around. Sorry, I have a little dog um, who just decided to see what I was doing. Mm. Um, so, 
like for me, you know, when I'd left home, just, you know, knowing that, oh, homosexuality is when a man likes a man or a woman likes a woman. And in my head, I was like, okay, but I don't, I don't understand how or what. But then when I met my friends who were gay and I'm like, well, I don't care. I don't understand. I don't understand why I am meant to hate these people or, you know, it was in my head, it was still us versus them. Like, you know, but this, I was 16. And I feel really sad that my head went to those conclusions where I'm like, those people. But, you know, just being growing up like that, those were my thoughts. I was like, but I don't want to hate people who love men or who, you know, like, I don't understand this differences or why, you know, I should even, why it's my responsibility to even say anything or think that they're going to hell. So, you know, like that, those were my views built on, and th those were my views at the time. And I had dated people who were Muslim at the time and they were like, yeah, but you know, being gay, they're still gonna go to hell. And it was so shocking to me to see that somebody that I really cared for would, you know, and because he's Muslim, he's already created that division that, you know, they're gonna go to hell. Like being straight was, you know, being straight was, you know, the only thing one person could be. And, you know, until I'd left Islam, I didn't actually think about how people were being persecuted, not only Muslim majority countries, but also Christian majority countries and secular countries. And it was until I started Faithless Hijabi and, you know, learning and hearing about other people and, you know, championing for LGBT rights that it really pushed me to consider that it's not just Islam that's against LGBT rights, it's also Christianity, it's also Judaism as well. But right now in the West, um, for like thinking about things near me in the UK, you know, the protests outside schools about, you know, keep my, keep my children away from, you know, the LGBT community or etc. They're mostly led by Muslims, and they're mo and they're supported as well by Christians who think alike. And you know, sometimes we have a tendency to isolate, like you know, it's only Islam that does this, or it's only Christianity. But the one thing that unites a lot of people is the things they have in common. And in this case, the hate for gay people was one of them, which kind of brings me to the question there. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just gonna have a bit of water. No problem. Um, that, which brings me to the question, have you considered converting to Judaism and Christianity if you still believe in one? Um, I read up a lot about it. I think when you leave Islam or when you leave a faith, you want to know what's the, what what is next or what now? Like, where do I go from here? What is hell? What is heaven anymore? And I have to admit, like, I think the easiest part about leaving Islam was accepting that I have to leave God or that I don't believe in God or coming to terms with that. That was the easiest part. And I say this because I've studied engineering and computer science and IT. So I've been in, I've been, my, my thoughts have been structured in a very methodical way that the argument of the argument against existence of God made a lot more sense to me than the argument for God. And then by extension, neither Christianity or Judaism were appealing to me at all. I I mean, it was it was very it, it is very common for a lot of people to realize that, you know, they don't know what their identities were are when they leave faith. And that was the case for me. I looked into Buddhism as well. But I think I never felt spiritually connected to the idea of God or to the idea of uh, any supernatural, really. Um, so I did consider it, but I don't think it was for me. And I had never missed that part of religion. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to start again. Um, sorry. But maybe. I, oh, thanks. Oh, 
I was just going to say, but maybe I could clarify a bit more about my journey sure. as an atheist now. Um, when I was young, um, when I was young and or when I was 24 and I had left faith, I was very like anti-theist. And to, this, to an extent, I'm, I still am, but that's only to the portion of religious people or theists that, you know, impose the view of God onto others. I don't have a problem with people believing in God. I have a problem with people imposing their beliefs, their values on other people. And, you know, that's a that could be a very logical or a rational statement for somebody to make. But I thought about, you know, how that breaks down to, you know, what what is when people shove their values to other people? You know, is it just proselytizing? Is it, you know, banning abortion? Is it, um, you know, telling you how you should live? And yes, all the above, but also how you teach God to children as well. I do believe that if we were never taught about God until we were like 14, 15, we would have a more healthier relationship with God or with faith, with society as well, because we would then be able to you know, realize that, you know, I'm an adult, I've lived for like, let's say 13, no, you know, 13 to 18 years, not adult, but youth that has lived for that long. But um, do I believe in a supernatural? Does it bring me a connection? Do I find a connection? And, you know, at least we're then able to question things in a safe space, or we're able to critically think about the smaller ideas of God or what comes with religion as well. And I don't quite like religion and I still don't. I'm very, I'm very angry about a lot of, you know, a lot of things that religion has taken away from me, from other people, from other, even other religious people as well, like women in Saudi Arabia, Iran, etc. Um, I feel I feel very angry about it, but I also know it's not the fault of religious people everywhere. It is the fault of their leaders. It is the fault to some degree of their parents who taught them the hate that they impose on other people. And I think I'm slowly becoming a bit more um, empathetic to people who, people who are constantly, um, I want to say ridiculed or bigoted against by non-religious people for being religious. Um, I also have to fight the urge in me and fight other people or also fight other atheists and just try to bring a more balanced view. Um, but it's been a hard journey and I don't know if it gets easier for everybody. I, I don't think capitalism is great. I don't think capitalism is a problem, uh, is, is the real problem. I think there is there's a lot of nuance to be applied um, I think I would be a hypocrite if I said, you know, I do not like capitalism or I, I don't love it, but I do like earning what I do. And yeah, so sorry. Your... So those questions. No, this is the, it was about the, it, it's about what you were just talking about, the capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has your family been uh, understanding of, of your deconversion, generally? My family? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think they understand it quite a bit. Maybe maybe not my dad as much, but um, I think you know my siblings do. My siblings understand my points. They don't agree with everything. They agree with some. They have their own. You know, like me before I left, they have their own interpretation of it. And I think that means a lot more to me than I could ever ask, because I know in that way, I'm very lucky to have that um, compassion from that and from them and the understanding as well. And that is also, and they are also a reason that kind of brings me back to understand that not all religious people are bad. Um, and I know there are people who think like that, but, you know, every time I think about, oh my God, Islam is this, I need to separate that from Muslims. I need to consciously separate that because I have to remind myself that I was once that and I was still very 
you know, in a sense, very integrated in Australia as a Muslim. Um, and I know a lot of people, I, I don't want to say a lot of people, but I know that, you know, most people are well-meaning than the ones that we encounter that do bad. Yeah, sorry, the puppy had to go away. He was making noise. That's all right. Um, and my closing question, um, what would your advice be to people that are stuck in the middle, uh, that people that are Muslim that are questioning their faith and and uh, are, are on a journey potentially into, into leaving uh, the faith? And my second part to that question is, is where can they find the faithless hijabi? Yeah, um, I believe it's somebody's own journey to be in the faith, to leave the faith. And it's very, you can be very easily peer influenced or in my case, shamed into keeping my decision the way it is uh, when I was a Muslim. So I really think that this has to be your journey. Take it at your pace. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. I think you need to question each idea separately as well. And um, also evaluate whether any religion, including Islam, meets um, meets the values that you hold, um, and you know, really think about you know where your line is, where where your limits are, because that changes over time. So even if you're not ready to like leave Islam, maybe or communicate to other people, then maybe keep it to yourself first and then see how you feel about it in a few months. And, you know, whether that decision to leave is still the same or whether you'd like to explore a different version of Islam that might bring you a bit more peace. I think it's important to separate that, um, that trying to fit in mindset that a lot of people have, whether they're religious or when they leave religion. Um, I think that's uh, probably the best advice I can give. Um, I don't want to influence people to leave the faith when they're not ready, and I want I want that to be their decision. Um, and in terms of faithless hijabi, we are on all social medias except for Threads, and I think our website www.faithlesshijabi.org is probably the best way to find us. Um, but yeah. Oh, well, thank you for joining me today, Zara Kai. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.